Good morning, everyone. We're glad to see all of you here this morning. I know that uh, this is a weekend when people normally travel quite a bit, but uh, whatever your plans are this weekend, I hope you'll take time to remember those who gave their lives in service to our country. And toward that end, I'd ask that you stand and let's sing together America the Beautiful. Welcome and good morning to Alaska Baptist Church. Uh, those of you that are visiting with us for the first time, we welcome you. Those that are watching online, we welcome you too. A little bit of a reverb or something going on here. But uh, glad to have you here today on this Memorial uh, Weekend. Uh, we typically start off with a, a song that honors the Lord for giving us our nation. And I think on this Memorial Day weekend, we should uh, particularly take the time to not only thank the Lord for the country we have, but to pray for the country that we have, that God's grace would not only continue to be on it, but that uh, he would draw her back to himself. And so we're thankful for our country. I think it's a good thing that we should acknowledge that, and we want to let the Lord know this morning we're here to worship him. 
but we are grateful for the country that he's allowed us to live in these many years, and we pray for her. In your bulletin, you'll notice several things. There's an insert there about the upcoming open houses, and uh, Jason Blue's open house is uh, going to be held in August. A particular date is to be announced. Uh, Anthony Harrison's open house is going to be on Saturday, June 26th from 11 a.m. to 2, and it's going to be here at Alaska Baptist Church down in the Fellowship Zone, as well as Peyton Stewart's open house, which was originally planned to be at another location. I'm not going to say the location because I don't want you to get confused, but because of the restrictions with COVID and all, it's been rescheduled to be here. So please note, uh, especially if you have received invitations previously uh, showing that her open house was somewhere else, note that it will be on Thursday, June 3rd from 6.30 to 9 p.m. here at Alaska Baptist Church. So make sure you make that connection and that correction. Um, also, uh, announcement for the student ministries are going on their youth missions trip down to Asheville, uh, Carolina on the 10th. They had a car wash over at the DNW in Caledonia yesterday. And Connie, how well did they do? $715.75. Awesome. Yep. So uh, great uh, fundraiser there. Next Sunday, we'll, uh, along with the coffee and uh, uh, punch that we serve here after the services, they're going to have hot dogs available as a fundraiser for the student ministry's uh, missions trip as well. So that will be next Sunday. Also in your bulletin, you'll notice upcoming events. Um, uh, not, um, note that because of Memorial Day on Monday, the office is typically closed, or is always closed on Mondays anyway. It will also be closed on Tuesday. That uh, gives the office staff a holiday day uh, on Tuesday. So the office will be closed on Tuesday. Uh, the missions trip is the 10th. They'll be leaving there. And uh, on the 20th, on Father's Day, we're going to have our second um, baccalaureate service here for our graduating seniors. So uh, you'll want to make a note to be here for that. Uh, we did that last year because of uh, the COVID restrictions. Uh, the colleges and high schools weren't allowing uh, back, uh, commencement services to be held. And so we had the students come here in their cap and gowns and they marched in and we had a service and we dedicated them to the Lord and saw them off with celebration. We're gonna do the same thing this year, even though they have uh, the option of going to a commencement service, we're gonna have what's called a baccalaureate service. And just to make sure you understand that, a commencement service is what the schools do where they graduate the students a baccalaureate service has traditionally been a religious service where they ask God's blessing upon those who have graduated. And over recent years, uh, baccalaureate services have sort of fallen by the wayside and they've just done commencement. Well, um, we're doing a baccalaureate service here. It'll be held on Father's Day. So please make a note of that. Then on the back of your bulletin, you'll see a list of prayer requests. Um, have some updates there. Larry and, Bob, Larry and Dolly Bear, good to have them here today. They've been down uh, very seriously with uh, the COVID virus over the past several weeks. Uh, continue to pray for Anna Stevens as uh, tests that she's had this past week were uh, inconclusive. And so continue to pray for her health issues. Um, the Stevens family, um, Elta Stevens here, of course, and, and Wayne, Marsha. Um, Elta's son, Bob, passed away rather suddenly a week ago, uh, Wednesday. Uh, so continue to pray for their family as they mourn the loss of, of her son. And also, uh, Esther Wamberg had her hip surgery last week. She came through with uh, flying colors. Uh, she's now in the process of recovering and wish you would pray for her in that. I think that's all the announcements that um, I'm going to mention to you. Certainly uh, can read the bulletin for the rest of the announcements so that you might be aware of that. Also, since um, COVID, we haven't been passing an offering plate, so there's been no real tangible way for us to recover 
um, visitors cards and or uh, offerings that you have, but we do have a box, a, a movable box in the foyer that if you have a visitor's card, if you fill that out, please drop that in there. That'll allow us to have a record. And your gifts, your offerings also can go in there uh, as you come and go. With that in mind, would you pray with me and we'll continue. Our Father, we count it a privilege to be in this country. And Lord, we, we are not uh, by any means misguided that our country has gone quite a, way, quite a, way, a ways away from you. And Lord, that grieves us, but we trust you. And Lord, we bring our country to you, particularly today, and ask that you would stir the hearts of our leaders and of our citizens, and that you would bring about an awakening and a revival and a turning back to you. And Lord, we'll pray that uh, as long as we can pray. And Lord, we pray that if that should not happen and things become worse, that you would build in us a strength and a conviction to stand for you regardless of where we are. And Father, I pray for this country, and I pray that you would bless her, and that you would uh, cause a sense of conviction and repentance to fall over her. Lord, may that begin with us, and may it spread from us to others. And so, Father, we think today of those who have served and have died uh, through the many wars and times of the past. And we, we thank you for their service, and uh, I pray, Lord, that we would have that kind of conviction to serve you today in all that we do. So, Father, we ask that you bless this service, that you bless the ministry of the word as it's presented, that the music and the songs that we sing, the fellowship we enjoy would strengthen us and encourage us that we might be faithful witnesses for you in the week ahead. Again, we ask your blessing upon us now. We give you praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand again as we continue worshiping this morning. Lord, we believe. 
taken from Psalm 104. Bless the Lord my soul, Lord my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a cloak, stretching out heaven like a tent curtain. He lays the beams of his upper chambers in the waters, he makes the clouds his chariot. 
He walks on the wings of the wind. He makes the wind his messenger, flaming fire his minister. He established the earth upon its foundations so that it will not totter forever and ever. You covered it with the deep sea as with a garment. The waters were standing above the mountains. They fled from your rebuke. At the sound of your thunder, they hurried away. The mountains rose, the valley sank down to the place which you established for them. You set a boundary so that they will not pass over, so that they will not return to cover the earth. He sends forth springs in the valleys. They flow between the mountains. They give drink to every animal of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. The birds of the sky dwell beside them. They lift up their voices from among the branches. He waters the mountains from the supper chambers. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of his works. Lord, how many are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your possessions. There is the sea, great and broad, in which are swarms without number, animals both great and small. They all wait for you to give them food in due season. You give it to them, they gather it up. You open your hand, they are satisfied with good. You hide your face, they are terrified. You take away their breath, they perish and return to dust. You send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. He looks at the earth and it trembles. He touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. May my praise be pleasing to him. As for me, I shall rejoice in the Lord. Thank you for reading this morning. Let's continue singing. The splendor of the King, so good majesty, let all the earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice, he wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, it trembles at his voice, it trembles at his Oh, 
of grace is our God, and now we'll see how great, how great is our God. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God, and now we'll see how great. This time the children are dismissed. It's good to see our college, our college students back for the summer. And you can see Andrew up on the stage with the praise team and others here. We'll be able to enjoy them all this summer. This um, this morning I'd like to take our time and talk about um, memorials. And next week, we'll get back into our, our um, series on eschatology. We'll be introducing you to the subject of the tribulation, or Daniel's 70th week. So if you want to sort of prep for that in advance, I would encourage you to go back into the book of Daniel and read Daniel chapter 9, particularly verses 24 to 27. And then we're going to be looking at the book of Revelation and uh, introducing chapters 6 to 19. So that'll be next Sunday. We'll continue on our subject. This morning, however, um, Memorial Day, um, there's one particular text in the, the scriptures that I particularly like to go to on this moment. And it's the time when Israel entered into the land and began their conquest. Uh, but before we do that, I would like to, you to see a short uh, intro on Memorial Day.
again want to come to you this morning and thank you for the country that you've given to us. The grace that you've put upon her and for the faithful men and women who have served and have given their lives for the freedoms that we enjoy today. Lord, again, I pray that you would awaken this country. Lord, would you awaken your church? Because this country needs to know Jesus. And we're the ones that you've called to take the message of the gospel to our country. May we give you thanks for the freedom we have. May we never take it for granted. And I do ask your blessing upon us in this country, for Jesus' sake. Amen. I wish we could retain in our thinking such emotion and such heartfelt gratitude when it comes to the death of our Lord and the eternal life that we have because of him. Probably because we celebrate it routinely every month, we lose that acute sense of his love and dedication and sacrifice for us. But today as we think about Memorial Day and you may have family members who have given their life in past wars and conflicts, this is of particular significance to you. I hope you will find comfort and consolation in your heart. But I want to take us in a, a different direction and in a more personal direction this morning as we consider uh, these things. I took this off the internet. This is one of several monuments on um, the Normandy coast. This one happens to be the Omaha Beach Monument that uh, pays tribute to D-Day. D-Day stands for the amphibious attack of Operation Neptune, which took place on June 4th, 77 years ago, on 40, uh, 1944, where three, over 300,000 troops landed and 4,000 4, were wounded during that conflict. You can't read the inscription. The, the inscription on the top is in French. Maybe some of you can, but uh, the inscription reads this. The Allied forces landing on this shore, which they call Omaha Beach, liberate Europe, June 6, 1944. And I'm sure that that um, monument for people who have maybe visited there, maybe uh, veterans who made that landing and had visited there, when they would see that monument, it would bring untold emotion and significance to them as they saw that. It brings a great deal of emotion to people like ourselves who weren't personally involved in that, just realizing the, the sacrifice and significance of it. But... Um, in Joshua, we have a, an account where the nation Israel, uh, under the guidance of God, brought them into the promised land and conquered the land. And they made such a monument at the Jordan, at the city of Gilgal, when they entered in. And this monument was to be a perpetual reminder to them to the dedication and the decision to follow the Lord and to conquer the land in the history of Israel. So if you have your Bibles, I'd like to take us in that direction this morning. If you would turn to Joshua chapter 1, we're going to skip around a little bit on that to get to where I want to go. But Joshua chapter 1, verse 11 says, uh, Joshua having received his orders from the Lord, says, the Lord told Joshua, pass through the midst of the camp 
and command the people, saying, Prepare provisions for yourself. For within three days you're to cross over this Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord God is giving to you. Now if you skip over to chapter 4, Well, I'm going to back up to actually chapter 3, but um, chapter 3, verse, verse 1. It says, And Joshua rose early in the morning, and he and all the sons of Israel set out from Shittim and came to the Jordan, and they lodged there before they crossed. And it came about at the end of three days that the officers went through the midst of the camp, and they commanded the people, saying, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, which the Levitical priests are carrying it, when you, when you shall, it's then that you shall set out from your place and go after it. However, there shall be a distance between you and it of 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near it that you, may not, that you may know the way by which you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. The story builds this way. Moses brought the people out of Egypt through the Red Sea to Mount Sinai. They spent 40 years in the wilderness. Now Moses has passed away and Joshua is the new commander in chief. He takes the nation of Israel up along the east side of the, uh, of the Jordan, the Transjordan area. And they're about to cross over from Shittim into the, what's called the Transjordan area of Palestine to take possession of Canaan. And as they begin this, it's a monumental moment in Israel's history. They had experienced coming out of Egypt and entering through the Red Sea and experiencing what we would say in, in symbolism is the redemption of God of the nation Israel. Israel being brought out of Egypt and brought through the Red Sea is a picture of salvation through Jesus Christ. It was the monument that was established in memory of that was the Passover, where they would sprinkle the blood on the doorposts and the lintel of their homes in memory of the fact that on that particular day in Egypt that God went through the camp and delivered the Israelites from the Egyptian bondage. He brought them out of Egypt and to that barrier of the Red Sea, which really marked the redemptive purpose of God when he opened the Red Sea, delivered them through, and closed it. The Red Sea was never opened up again. It was a one-time uh, permanent kind of experience, and it describes what salvation in Jesus Christ is to an individual today. It marks that moment when you come to Christ and you say, I'm a sinner and I'm separate from you, I'm lost and undone in my sin, and I need a Savior. I believe Jesus died in my place for my sin, so I'm asking him to come into my life and to be my Lord and Savior, to forgive me. When that takes place, salvation comes to an individual. It comes immediately and permanently. It can't be undone because it's, com it's a complete work of the grace of God. And so crossing through the Red Sea marks the redemption of Israel. It is in, in type uh, the significance of a believer today once they have trusted Christ as their Savior and they know that they are children of God. It marks the beginning of their life lived for the Lord Jesus. That salvation isn't just getting your sins forgiven so you can go to heaven one day. It's having your sins forgiven so that you can live in a right relationship with the God of creation. Certainly one day to live with him forever, but eternal life begins with, with that desire to want to be in a right relationship with God right now today. You see, it's a foreign thought to look at salvation as something that you can, you can go to the store or go to the church and purchase and, and have it like a, a get-out-of-jail-free card or get-out-of-hell-free card so that now you can live your life in any way you want 
with yourself being the Lord of your life and, and coming to the end of your life and when it comes time to die, say, oh, by the way, I have this card that gets me into heaven. That to me is a completely misunderstood and I think the gospel has been misrepresented that way. See, the gospel is, is the good news that you and I, apart from Christ, can come back into a right relationship with God today, now, and forever. It is foreign to the concept of salvation by grace to, to have a person that says, I want to be saved, but I don't want to live for God in my life. That's like trying to take it's like trying to pull a wool over God's eyes, saying, oh yes, I want my sins forgiven, but I really want to live my life in sin and however I want to live it. I want to live a godless life, but I also want God to protect me from the, the thought of eternal death and separation from God. It's the question of, do I want a right relationship with God? And I would ask you that. Are you here today because you want a right relationship with Jesus Christ? Or do you come today because you want to somehow um, convince yourself by coming to church and saying this or that, that, that that secures that you won't go to hell one day, but that your life is, is really just whatever you want to do with it, that God has nothing to do with it. He has no right to impose himself on your thoughts and your life, your decisions in life, your, how you live your life. Salvation is something that you ask because you want to be back in a right relationship with God today, right now, and forever. So it, it's, a, it's an oxymoron to me to be a Christian and not want to have the Lord rule your life. It's, it's incongruent to me to say that, that I want Jesus to forgive me of my sins, but I want to be able to live my life however I want to live it. That doesn't make sense to me. And I don't think it makes sense to God either. And I think when a person comes to him and says, I want you to come into life and forgive me of my sins so I can go to heaven one day because I now want to live my life however I want to live it, I don't believe God saved you. I don't think you're being honest with yourself and I don't think you're being honest with God but God will always be honest with you. So you're here today and you say I'm a Christian. Well what does that mean to you today? We're here as citizens of the United States. What does that mean to you today? Well it should mean that uh, this country is important enough to you, that you abide by its laws, you participate in its, in its system, and if necessary, you take arms to defend it against foreign and domestic intrusions. If you're a Christian today, it's, it's because you believe you're a child of God, you're part of his eternal kingdom, you're part of his church today on the earth, and you want to live for him throughout this life, and when this life is over, in his presence, you live for him in whatever way, whatever fashion he wants you to. I think, again, the gospel has misrepresented itself by many. Thinking that, well, if I, if I ask Jesus in my life, I get to go to heaven and there's streets of gold and I get a mansion and if I've spent my whole life fishing and hunting, I get to spend my eternity fishing and hunting in heaven, or whatever heaven, heaven becomes your, your epitome of what you want to do here on earth, I, I think to myself, what is the difference between that and being uh, Muslim today and making your heaven whatever it is, seven, having 72 virgins or whatever? Uh, heaven becomes something of, that just magnifies whatever your your personal, self-centered kind of, of existence, you think that God is going to forgive you so that you can live that way here and live that way? Do you think that's... 
I, don't, I think the gospel has been so misrepresented in the world today, it's not funny. The gospel is about realizing that we're sinners separated from a God who created us, and he deserves to be served by us. And our hearts say, I don't want to serve God, I want to serve myself. And religion has contoured itself so that you can serve God and self at the same time. And I'm saying God doesn't have any part of that. And since we're talking eschatological things, you get to Revelation chapters 2 and 3 on the seven churches. I think that's exactly what the last form of the Christian church is going to look like on earth, the Laodicean church where God spits it out of his mouth. I think that's the description of an, an apostate church. I think it's a description of a false gospel. If you don't want to live for Jesus Christ today, why would you ever want him to come into your life? Well, because I don't want to go to hell one day, because that sounds really bad. And I want to go to heaven one day because that is going to be whatever I want to make of it. Well, I'm sorry, you're wrong on both parts. You have a heart that does not want to live for Jesus Christ. And when Jesus comes into your life, he changes that heart. And if your heart hasn't been changed, then I'm sorry, you have not truly been born again. I don't know what it is you have, uh, whatever religion or membership or whatever, but I'm telling you this, you're not on your way to heaven if you don't want to live for Jesus Christ today. What in heaven's name, no pun intended, are you going to do in heaven? I want to live for him today. I want to serve him today. When I drop dead and stand in his presence, I want to live for him and serve him in heaven in whatever way he wants. I don't care. Well, you mean you don't want a mansion? I don't want a mansion now. This crossing of the Jordan, what I'm saying is to Israel, is what to me is in front of every true believer in Jesus Christ today. They were delivered from Egypt, and God shut the Red Sea so that they could not go back there. That was permanent for sure. But now the decision was a conscious one. Are you going to follow me? Are you going to follow me? Do you want to follow me? Do you want to do what I want you to do to possess the land that I've given for you? Do you want to do this? Are you prepared to do this? And Joshua is instructed by God to say to the people, now listen, I want you to think about it. I'm giving you three days to think about this. Because this is a decision that is monumental. It's a turning point in your life. It's a decision that says, I know that I've given my life to Jesus Christ and he's forgiven me of my sin. And this moment, this time in my life, I'm thinking I need to make a conscious, permanent decision to live for him and to follow him, to do his will wherever it takes me. We used to call that in churches years ago, uh, dedication. I remember as, as a child, trusting Christ as my Savior, um, maybe even, I probably even went forward, you know, to make that public when I was baptized. Um, but the day that I dedicated my life to serve Jesus Christ was a completely different experience than when I asked him into my life. And I think that that is so very important for us today and for Alaska Baptist Church, and this is why. You may have grown up in this church. Your parents are Christians. You may have trusted Jesus as your Savior in junior church or in vacation Bible school or at home, and, and Christianity has been cultural. 
your friends have been here, you've sort of grown up in this, there will be a day, there must be a day in your life when you ask your question, you ask yourself this question, do I really belong to Jesus Christ? And I think that's the time when you ought to make that decision and mark it. Particularly in my thinking, I think that's what believer's baptism is about. But it isn't just being baptized. It's about making a statement, crossing a line, drawing a line in the sand, whatever expression you want, where you say, from this point out, my life is going to be serving the Lord Jesus in whatever he wants me to do. And that doesn't mean I have to be a missionary or a pastor. I mean in whatever God wants you to do. That's where Israel is in chapter 1, and particularly in chapter 3, where he says, I want you to follow the ark. So here's the story. Joshua says, in three days, we're going to get together. The priest and the ark of the covenant is going to set out. He's going to start heading uh, west towards the Jordan River. And we're to stay 2,000 cupids behind that, which is like, what, 3,000 yards or whatever. And so that you would know where that ark is going, because you don't know where God's leading. And what a picture that is of the word of God of saying, I need to follow what God has said. So the ark is going to be out there so I don't get ahead of it or go on a tangent. I want to follow it. You can't do that, by the way, if you're ignorant of God's word. So Christians ought to be in the scriptures, reading it, studying it, memorizing it, thinking about it, praying about it, yielding themselves to it, and God will lead you in the way he wants you to go. So the priests get up on this third day and they get the Ark of the Covenant, they pick it up and they start walking towards the Jordan River and God says the the moment that they step into the water, it also tells us the Jordan was flooded, it was flood season, so the Jordan was probably a couple miles wide at that point. So it says as soon as the priests come to the, the brink of that flooded Jordan, as soon as their toes dip into the water, as soon as they stepped into it, They're going to stand still, and God's going to shut off the Jordan River some 18 miles north at the city of Adam, and the waters of the Jordan would shut off from there all the way down to the Dead Sea, and there would basically be a dry riverbed from Adam to the Red Sea, probably 25 miles wide for the nation of Israel to pass through. And so that's what happened. So the nation of Israel, if you can picture this in your mind, I see the Red Sea as them going through sort of single file. I don't know if it's actually one and one, but a narrow cut through the the Red Sea. The the Jordan River is a wide, wide thing where people were, were lined up. So it's way more individual as they lined up to that river to cross over. And I can't emphasize to you how important it is for you personally to know in your heart, regardless of your parents, your siblings, your friends, the question is, have you made a decision in your life as a Christian to serve the Lord with your life? This is what Joshua has asked the people. It's now time to... to, um, to cross over the line because when we get into the Canaan land, we're going to battle. We're going to go to battle. God's going to be with us, but we're going to battle. And God's going to give us the promised land here, which was like our Christian life, but he's going to give us victory. He's going to give us blessing in the midst of it as long as we follow him. It is a decision to step over that line. And so they did. It says, and Joshua said to the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord's going to do wonders among you. And Joshua spoke to the priests to take up the Ark of the Covenant and cross over ahead of the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went ahead of the people. And now the Lord said to Joshua, this day I'll begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that just as I have been with Moses, I'll be with you. Skipping down to chapter 3, verse 11. 
It says, Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over ahead of you into the Jordan. Now then, take for yourselves twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one man from each tribe, and it shall be come about when the soles of the feet of the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the water of the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan shall be cut off, and the waters which are flowing down from above, that is from Adam, shall stand in one heap. So it came about when the people set out from their tents to cross the Jordan with the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant before the people. And when the, those who carried the Ark came to the Jordan, and the feet of the priests carrying the Ark were dipped into the edge of the water, for the Jordan overflows its bank all the days of the harvest, that the water which were flowing down from above stood up and rose up in one heap a great distance away at Adam, the city that is beside Zarephath, and those which were flowing down towards the sea to the Arabah, the salt sea, which is the Dead Sea, were completely cut off, so the people crossed opposite to Jericho. So that's what happened. He said, we're going to follow the Ark of the Covenant. I'm going to follow the Lord. Are we going to follow the Lord, or are we going to do our thing? We're going to follow the Lord. Okay, so the priest picked up the Ark. They went out into the, the water, Soon as their feet dipped in the water, they stopped. The water shut off at Adam. The riverbed dried up for 25 miles, and the people prepared to cross over. <coughs> Chapter 4. Now it came about when the nation had finished crossing the Jordan that the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Take for yourselves 12 men from the people, one man from each tribe, and command them, saying, Take for yourselves twelve stones from here, up, uh, out of the midst of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet are standing, and carry them over with you, and lay them down in the, lo in the lodging place where you lodge tonight. So Joshua called the twelve men whom he had appointed, the sons of Israel, one man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, Cross again to the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. And each one of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Israel. And let this be a sign to you. Here's the important thing. Let this be a sign among you so that when your children ask later, saying, what do these stones mean to you? Then you will say to them, because the waters of the Jordan were cut off, be off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, when it crossed the Jordan... The waters of the Jordan were cut off, so these stones shall become a memorial to the sons of Israel forever. Well, the story continues. I won't read it all for you, but they walked across, they got across the Jordan River, and then they, got, they come out on the, the west side of the Jordan, and Joshua said, those 12 men that I had picked out before, one from each tribe, I want you to go back, and I want you to take up a stone, one each of you, where the priests are standing. So they went back across the Jordan, and the, the Ark of the Covenant was still there with the priests, and they each picked up a stone, and they carried it across to the west side of the Jordan to the city of Gilgal. That was their, their headquarters. And there they established those 12 stones as a monument. Okay? Then the story says that the Lord told Joshua, I want you to go back into the, into the Jordan River, back to where the priests are, and you're to take 12 stones, and you're to stack them up where the priests are. So we have two monuments. Okay? There's a monument where the priests first went into the river, Joshua stacked up those stones, and then the 12 men picked one stone up each, and they took it over to the other side of the river where they came out, and they stacked the stones there. So you, now you have two monuments one on either side of the Jordan River at its widest possible spot during flood season. They stack these stones up. And Joshua was told that these stones will be a reminder, a memorial, marking the day that Israel left the wilderness and came into the promised land. It marks the day that they decided they were going to follow God and do his will in every area of their life. They were going to come into the land 
and take all that God had promised to them. So they have these two monuments. The flood season ceased, the river, uh, river flowed again, it became narrow, and each time people would go to Gilgal, they would see these two stone monuments. And the river was probably only maybe a hundred yards wide, but you had this monument a mile this side and a mile that side of the Jordan River. And the question was when their children would go back and see that and see this monument and say, well, what's this monument for? And they say, what's that monument way over there and way over here and the Jordan in the middle? That's when you would say to them, this marks the day when God did a great thing in our nation's life where we left the wilderness and we went on to serve God and to conquer the land and now we have the land of Canaan today. It would be sort of like this monument on Normandy's beach, Omaha, the Omaha Beach Monument. There was like, I think, five different beachheads that they, that they uh, established that day. Each one represents a day when the Allied troops came in, they crossed the English Channel, they crossed into France and, and liberated Europe. To us today, they mark a day when men and women came across that, that uh, channel, gave their lives, many of them, but they liberated Europe as a result. What a, a monumental and, and wonderful occasion at a great cost. This is what this memorial at Gilgal was to be to Israel. It was to be a monument that said, in Israel's life, they were redeemed, they were stalled out in the wilderness of indecision and, and unfaithfulness. Then there was a time when they said, yes, we're going to go into the land and we're going to take what God wants, we're going to follow him and receive what he has for us. This is what this monument is. And so, what is it at for? There. Here it is. Three things. I'm just keying off the three days. This monument reminds me or is significant to me for three reasons. Number one, it was a day of conviction and decision on behalf of Israel. It was a day when, it, when Joshua said, are we going to go into the land or not? By the way, they'd been asked that twice before, right? When they first came out of Egypt, they sent the spies in. They seen all this land, all that God promised, and they came back and the spies said, you know, 10 said, no way. Joshua and Caleb said, we, we can and should. And because of the unbelief of the nation, God had them stay in the wilderness for one full generation, for 40 years, until that whole generation of unbelief was died away, and a new generation of believing Israelites came that would go into the land. Then he said, are we going into the land? So now this new generation says, I don't want to live in the wilderness. I don't want to live a Christian life that is on my own, doing my thing, whatever. I want to follow the Lord with my life. And beloved, I think that every Christian ought to have that time in their life where their Christianity, their salvation is matured and a, a decision is made, I want to live for Jesus Christ with my life. And I'm telling you, if we don't do that, your Christian life will just be uh, nominal. You won't have the joy of the Lord in your life. You won't have the victory of God in your life. You'll have what Israel had in the wilderness as opposed to the promised land that they had. It's a decision. It's a personal decision. So I ask you, do you know, first of all, that Jesus Christ is your Savior? If so, is he really the Lord of your life? Or is it just your religion? Or is it your life? The second thing is, this was a day of consecration or dedication. He said, I want you to consecrate yourself. I want you to think about it. I want you to ask yourself, uh, 
To them it was, their, are they an Israelite? Of course. Do they believe God's word and, and whether they wanted to go for it? I would say to you today, if you believe that Jesus Christ is your Savior, are you sure of that? Secondly, what about living your life? I want to encourage you, I want to urge you that you need to make a decision if you haven't to put Jesus Christ first in your life and in every area of your life. My future is yours. Lord, what do you want me to do? Well, my, counsel, my guidance counselor's school says I should do this or that. My parents I said I should, we should do this or that. Have you asked Jesus what he wants you to do? Is that even important? Comes to your dating life, your married life, who you marry. Uh, is it important to you who it is? Is it important enough to say, Lord, I want, a, I want a, a Christian husband or a Christian wife, somebody who loves Jesus and wants to put him first in my life, in their life? How could you ever expect to have a marriage that has the blessing of God if you both aren't believers and if you both don't want to follow Jesus in your life. You see, this point of dedication is so important. And thirdly, it it's, was also to them a day of commitment. Now, you say this, you say we're Israelites, we say we want to go into the land, but now it's day three. It's time to follow the ark and go in and cross the line and actually start doing what God wants you to do. I remember the day in my life, senior in high school, that I said, Lord, <laughs> I actually said, Lord, you get me through high school, I'm yours. Short prayer to the point, right? I said, Lord, get me through here and I'll do whatever you want me to do. And I remember the day that I walked out of the south entrance of Clawson High School on Broadacre Street. I opened those doors and walked out. The sun was out, and I stood there on the steps. And I don't know if I put my hands up in the air or not, but I said, Lord, I said it right out, Lord, right out loud, Lord, I'm yours, whatever you want me to do. At that time, I thought that was being a plumber, actually. I had made application, was accepted in the Local 98 Plumbers, plumbers Union in Detroit. I wanted to also go to Bible school and become a pastor at some point, but uh, I said, Lord, whatever you want me to do. And so I had my plans, and the Lord said, I don't want you to go through the plumbing trade. I want you to go to Bible school. I said, okay. The question is, have you had a point in your life as a Christian when you said, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I want to do? That's what this is about. It's about saying, Lord, either put up or shut up. Am I a Christian because I just like the idea and whatever, or am I a Christian because I want to walk with Jesus Christ? That's what this was about. Because it's a monument, a monumental day when you make that decision. But friends, over time, that monument becomes you. Now in Israel's life, they, the ones that crossed the Jordan, when they, uh, I don't know how often they were back there to see that, but it reminded them of what they did. It would be like a veteran today that, uh, say, served in Vietnam, and had an occasion to go to Washington and see the Vietnam War, uh, the wall there, the memorial. If they had been there, and those who have been there and have seen that, that would be of special significance to them because they were there. That wall represents them, and they are, are part of that. And I'm sure in Israel's day, those people that actually walked through the Jordan, when they're telling their kids about this monument, they were saying something that happened to them. They were there. It was real. It wasn't a pretend thing. And yet, in our lives as Christians, not only do we 
should we make this decision in our life, but our lives that, that we live from that point on become a monument in itself to our children. So that our children say to us, Mom, Dad, why is it that you live your life this way? Why do you, why do, you do this and why don't you do that? We should be able to say, because let me tell you, there was a moment in my life when I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. There was a moment in my life when I said I want to live for him. And that's why I do what I do and don't do what I don't do. You become a monument. And what greater monument could you be to your children than a monument to the testimony that you follow Jesus Christ as your Savior? I wish we could retain uh, these thoughts when we think of Calvary, when we come to the Lord's table each month. I wish we could, with the same emotion that we have on a Memorial Day or a Veterans Day or the 4th of July, say, Lord, lead me back to that reality, that, that memorial that most significantly demonstrates my life. And I think of this song, King of my life, I crown thee now, thine shall the glory be. Lest I forget thy thorn-crowned brow, lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thy agony, lest I forget thy love for me, Lord, lead me to Calvary. He says, Lord, may I be willing, Lord, to bear daily my cross for thee. Even the cup of grief to share, thou hast borne all for me. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thy agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. I pray that God would lead us to that decision today. And for you here that are young people particularly, your life is ahead of you, you're a Christian. Have you had that moment in your life when you said, Lord, I want to follow you wherever it is you want me to go, whatever it is you want me to do, whomever it is you want me to marry, I want to follow you. This day, May 30th, 2021, you could mark down in your Bible, say, this is the day, Lord, that I meant business with you. Yes, I know I'm a Christian, but from this day on, I want to follow you. This is my memorial day. I want to be able to look back at this day, celebrate it if you want, each Memorial Day say, yes, there was a day that I said I'm going to follow you and I'm going to follow you. Beloved, we need that more today than at any point in our, our church's history. You want to know what might bring our country back to, to more of a semblance of a God-fearing country? It's us. If we don't live for the Lord, how shall we ever expect other people to want to? If we want to be like them, why would they ever want to be like Jesus? May God encourage us to this point. Make this day a day to follow him and no apologies for it. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for loving us, for sending Jesus into this world. And Lord, we say that, I say that so many times. I don't want to lose the passion, the personal part of that. For without him, I would be lost. And with him, I've been found. And I thank you, Lord, that I can know you and I'm privileged to be able to, fo to follow you. Help me, Lord, to do that better. Help us, Lord, to follow you. I ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Thank you.
pastor. Let's stand as we close our service this morning. I'm grateful that 47 years ago, God brought into my life a woman that wanted to serve Jesus wherever he wanted her to be, and even with whomever he wanted her to be. David, can, can you back up two slides for me there, quick? Maybe I can... Back it up. This is my PowerPoint. Nope. To mine, yeah, my last third to the last slide. I can find it if you got it up there. This was. <laughs> <laughs> Can we zoom in on that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's my sweetheart. 1973, met here in Grand Rapids. And we were 
this picture visiting her brother down at Wright Patterson Air Force Base. And he wanted a picture, so I picked Diane up and set her on the roof. And <laughs> Happy anniversary, my love. Father, bless us. Thank you for blessing us. Amidst all the battles, amidst all the trials, amidst all the heartaches, I do it all over again, following you. I thank you, Lord, for bringing a woman into my life that loved you and that loves me. And I pray, Lord, that you bless her and us as we serve you until we see you face to face. Help us, Lord, help the young people, especially in this church, to realize how significant it is to make a decision to follow you, young in their life. May your hand be upon us all, I pray. For I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You're in case you want to leave.